Right then, um, welcome everybody to uh, the Northwest Talk. Um, this is our third virtual one um, following a doing them in person. Um, so welcome and um, I'll give you a bit of an intro of what's going to happen this morning. Um, so just to make sure I uh, get the right screen. Um, just to introduce ourselves, I'm Ella Worsdale. Um, I'm a Head of Information at Pennine Care and NHS Trust. I'm also a Tableau Ambassador for user groups. I'm very obsessed and passionate about Tableau. Um, probably uh, people will know that if they've been to a Tableau user group before, but um, I love it. It's a bit of a game changer from my point of view. Um, so good to see everybody. Lorna, do you want to introduce Sure. Uh, my name is Lorna Brown, formerly Lorna Eden. Um, I got married just before the lockdown last year, so I was very lucky to sneak that in before their caps on the weddings here in the UK. Um, I'm a Tableau and Alteritz consultant here at the Information Lab um, and I was previously a part of the Tableau uh, the Information Lab's data school as well. Um, I'm a current Tableau Zen master and a Tableau public ambassador as well. I also co-lead Workout Wednesday and help with the, t the Northwest Tableau user group. Colin? How do I follow that? <laughs> um... <laughs> So I'm Colin Vojtovich, I'm Director of Data Watch based in Chesler, which is a company of one. And I've been using Tableau for about four or five years to very simply visualise research data into intelligence for better decision making. So, uh, hello. I don't wear glasses anymore. Great, right, thank you. Oh yeah, I need to change the picture. <laughs> um, great, thank you. Um, so just to give you a run through of what's going to happen this morning, so obviously you've already uh, met and started to get used to Remo and hopefully been in chat to um, some people. Um, so we've just got this quick welcome and then we're going to jump right into some presentations. So we've got John from Slowland who's going to talk about the Tableau blueprint, can't speak, blueprint um, and adoption at scale. We've got a bit of a quiz that Colin's running. We like to have a quiz at the tug um, just to break, break up the uh, sessions and have a bit of fun. And then Steve. Um, it's going to talk about um, Tableau Centre of Excellence, which will run nicely from John's presentation about the blueprints. And then we're going to end the sessions with Abdi from Tableau, who's going to talk about all the new features in the last couple of upgrades. And then there's opportunity to stick around. Um, Remo's got a great facility of being able to kind of network and talk to people. So if you want to stick around, please do. We're going to keep Remo open for a little bit. Um, so stay around and have a chat. Um, we will be there. Um, so we're going to kick straight off um, with John's presentation if John wants to uh, jump in it just um, just to say the, just, cool. I was gonna say just to say these presentations are recorded so we'll be sharing a copy of the uh, presentations on our forum and to all our attendees so you can watch some of these afterwards and just for uh, we, oh. we kick off with presentations if you check out the chat I'm going to put the um, ID number for the Kahoot quiz and where you can join so you've got plenty of time to get set up and you also have the Q&A function as well. So if you, for any of the speakers, if you have any questions, please do check out the Q&A and hopefully we'll be able to get some answers to your questions. So, John, are you ready? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Loud and clear. Over and to you. And you can see me as well? Yeah. I can see you and your presentation. Fantastic. That's a really good start, isn't it? So feel free to pop questions in the chat or the Q&A as we go along, um, I don't mind, I've got it up on my other screen so I can try and refer to that as we go. So I'm John Cowan, I work for a consultancy called Slalom and Slalom um, works with clients across the Northwest, um, focused on technology transformation, digital transformation. It can be really technology heavy, uh, helping people migrate to the cloud. It can be really people focused, um, really thinking about the organizational um, impacts of change and often it's a balance of the two as they do really go hand in hand. So I'm going to talk about Tableau Blueprint and why I think it's great um, why it's a really powerful framework for, for using and understanding how you can make the most out of Tableau. I think what I really liked about um, Ella's introduction was that piece around really passionate about Tableau and I'd say very similar for me but I'm really passionate about the outcomes that Tableau can deliver for, for teams and for organizations as well. Um, and sometimes that can get a bit lost. Tableau can be a really powerful tool and individuals and teams can do something really compelling, but how do you make sure that you're taking that to the next level? How do you make sure that 
each individual, each team, your board level um, members are really getting the most out of that tool. And you can use it across the organization and get loads and loads of people really excited and really engaged. And if you've started using Tableau and started with a single dashboard, how can you scale it? And if you're already scaled, how can you make the most of that technology as well? So I'm going to talk through a few slides um, to give a bit of background on Blueprint. By all means, let me know in the chat. Have you heard of Blueprint? Have you um, you've never heard of it? You've seen lots of detail. Tableau have come to talk to you about it, perhaps other people. So, so a couple of no's. Um, well, I'll talk about why first off. Why do I think something like Blueprint is important? I will talk about um, Blueprint itself as a framework. And I'll also talk about something called Navigator, which is a similar view, just to give you a sense for frameworks like this, why they are important, but that Blueprint isn't necessarily the be all and end all. It provides a great steer. So let's talk about why. For me, I think what I always come back to is that as an individual, I'm much more data driven in my life. Um, and I think that that's pretty uh, prevalent across most organizations. From top to bottom, people are making data based decisions. So back when I was commuting into Manchester, I would be looking at my phone in the morning. I've got something that's really easy to digest in terms of the weather. Surprise, surprise, it's predicting rain on a few days in Manchester. So I need to wear a coat, I need to grab an umbrella, I need to get prepared. And it's something that's just built into my day to day routine. And if I apply that in the work context, you know, what's that workflow? How are people interacting with information? It's similar with getting the train. Do I need to adjust my behavior if something's going to be late? If there is a delay, I can maybe think about taking a different route. So how do people in organizations start to see that they're making data driven decisions in their personal lives um, and therefore they need to think about how they would apply similar sorts of data driven decisions in the work context? And I think there's such a big gap in that space. And some of these are really slick and easy to use. And they're very visual in a similar sort of sense to Tableau and what it can do. But if people really got the, um, the same sort of embedded processes in the organization yet. And when we talk to clients, we find the answers often no, and they're experiencing lots of different challenges. And those sorts of challenges are things that Blueprint are here to, um, to help address. So I've noted down here a couple of challenges that we often talk to clients about, and it could be things like governance. So um, do you have the right processes for using Tableau and getting people to use it effectively? Do you have um, processes that make sure the right visualizations are being developed and going through systems where you've got a development environment and a production environment, and um, it's similar to how you would run any other type of system? It could be really focused on data and, and data quality is obviously a huge challenge. And I think for lots of us who have built dashboards in the past or are building them currently, you know, the structure of data, the quality of data can have such a big impact on how long it takes to build something um, or the end results um, that you get. Um, and it could be other things like adoption. You know, are you um, getting the most, the biggest bang for your buck out of Tableau? Are people trained? in the right way to use those tools. So there's lots of different challenges that clients face. Some of them are about the dashboards themselves, but not all of them. And so frameworks like Blueprint are to say, Tableau and the viz elements of Tableau, you know, maybe some of it thinking about prep, and um, how can you make the most of that end-to-end -end process? I think um, lots of us will be in a position where you've done something fantastic in Tableau and you've got a lot of excitement, but if it breaks and if it doesn't work or if the data is wrong and there are questions, you can lose a lot of that momentum. So I'm going to take you through Blueprint and why I think it's a really good, useful framework for thinking really broadly about some of the solutions. The first thing um, to note really is that that broad word. So Blueprint and the picture that's presented here just gets you thinking about different topics beyond just using um, Tableau desktop or just using Tableau online. It's really um, presented like this as a tube map to get you thinking about certain topics and certain steps you might take on a path towards agility. 
or on a path towards getting people really proficient or what we often now talk to and clients about in terms of data literacy and understanding how you use and communicate with data. And also there's that piece around community. And I know Steve's gonna talk in depth about skills and roles and community and all of that as well, which I think links in really nicely with this conversation. So we want to use frameworks like this to think broadly about different topics in a way that's gonna boost participation, uh, boost excitement, get people to behave in the right way, all of which hopefully should get people to really buy into Tableau as a tool, get them to trust some of the dashboards, get them to start making decisions from information and build that into their day-to-day -day roles as well. And that could be from people really senior who are constantly asking for a new request and perhaps you can teach them to slice and dice some of the functionality and use some of that functionality. Um, or it could be analysts who actually are going to start investigating and playing more of that explorer role as well. So there's loads of great content behind here, um, all of which is presented on Tableau's website. And I'm going to talk through a couple of these areas. I'm going to specifically show you some of the assets that you can use, um, both online and there's a really handy spreadsheet that you can look through as well. Um, and we'll just touch on some of the details behind each of these different areas. So I wanted to present this first, and there are so many words on this slide, I don't expect you to read any of it. But all of this comes straight from the Tableau website, and it's really to demonstrate how much information there is on there. It can be a little off-putting at first, but you can also break it down and start to digest it. So don't be put off when you go and you start exploring Blueprint and you start trying to understand what agility is, because this would be the sort of view of that same content that I'd look to talk through. So you've got that first bit of the tube map looking at agility and it breaks it down, deployment, monitoring, maintenance of your applications and of your technology. And it just gives you some great insight. Um, and that can, again, it can be whether you're just starting on your Tableau journey or if you've already got um, Tableau use at an enterprise wide across different teams, across different regions. Can you see my, um, I'm, I can see a few questions in the chat that people maybe aren't able to see the slides moving along. Can people see the slide titled Agility? Agility, Agility, okay, fantastic. So it um, may have been a slight delay for some people. So when you're thinking about these elements, the great thing about the way that this blueprint is structured, and I will show you the website in a second, is that it provides you so much detail and so much content. So let's pick on deployment. How are you going to deploy Tableau? I'm sure that most of us will have started with something like Tableau Desktop, or perhaps you've just started with an individual Tableau public account. What about when you want to actually start deploying that to different teams? It talks you through the options of setting up a Tableau server, of using Tableau online, and it goes into so much detail and don't be put off by that because it's incredible for when you're trying to work this through. It's step by step on how you would set up Tableau Server. It's the guides that talk it through. It's got screenshots, it's got descriptions, it's got checklists for helping you to really understand. And if you're thinking about transitioning from just individual users, that's so powerful as a way of accelerating towards actually getting something set up. And if in your organization you um, have a relationship with Tableau and you are moving towards a, a place where you've got enough licenses to get a customer success manager as well, then they can talk you through a lot of that good practice. So all of these different topics provide so much information, not just on deployment, but let's pick monitoring. So there are suggestions for the different types of alerts that you need to set up, descriptions on how you set them up, a really good overview of what that brings to the table, in terms of making sure that you're managing your um, expectations of your customers, which is that second bullet point um, under monitoring. And that for me is one of the big things that I'll keep coming back to. You've got people excited about Tableau, you've produced a, a, an amazing looking visual that's really insightful and drives change. But if your performance is poor, as you onboard more teams and you've got that excitement, then you can really quickly lose momentum and people can say, oh, well, Tableau is really slow. 
Um, and if you think again, back to my own life, if it's slower than a website like Amazon, that probably will put me off. You know, where I'm so used to things working and loading really, really quickly. So managing your um, expectations of your customer base, all of these tools around monitoring, having really slick processes for deployment, having methods for communicating with people, they're all really powerful. And then there's things like maintenance. So what I like about this bullet point is it's getting you to think not just about taking a requirement, getting it finished off, publishing it out, but that there's something after that as well that we need to remember. We need to make sure that we're looking after our infrastructure. We need to make sure that we're thinking about how you would upgrade it. We need to make sure we're applying the same sort of concepts to the individual dashboards as well. What sort of monitoring have we put in place that enables us to do that maintenance? And it's something that people sometimes forget. And it's something that as a um, working in development teams in the past, we've been susceptible to. We've done something for a user and we're ready to move on to the next thing. That's done, let's move on to the next exciting project. Well, actually, we also need to make sure we've got the processes in place. If we're working in a agile um, method and perhaps we've got a scrum team together, how much capacity have we got for that maintenance piece as well? So that the, the stuff that we've already done remains fresh, remains compelling for people as well. It's just something, again, that I really like about this blueprint framework because it points you in the directions of thinking about and having those conversations. And for me, that's the real power of these frameworks. Let's have a look at a couple of the others then. Proficiency. So the one that really leaps out to me is always the piece around education. And I touched on a couple of those different license types. We have viewers and what sort of training is appropriate for viewers. Um, getting people to just interact with dashboards in a way. Um, maybe you're educating people on data literacy and things like that, so they can understand the content, understand how to read certain charts. And there's so much great material online, not just on the Tableau website, but about educating people how to actually really use this stuff. So I really like the, the fact they're getting you to think about education. Um, and making sure you're doing what's right for your organization by user type as well. You know, the, the, the viewer type individual, their need is going to be very different from someone who's actually building dashboards as a creator. And then somewhere in the middle, you've got that explorer role um, and that's going to be different again. So it's got to be tailored for different types of license and, and different users and um, different levels of seniority in the organization and perhaps how they interact with data. Um, and to use another word, different personas as well. So the person who's a really business analyst type hat on versus someone who's looking to make those decisions from data. Um, I really like um, from this list, the final piece around best practice. So for me, that's best practice um, in terms of uh, visualization. And you could be really thinking about what are the specific chart types that we like. Some people really hate pie charts, but there is absolutely a time and a place for them if they're done right. So what's the best practice that you could start thinking about there? Um, for me, one of the keys here is that it's best practice applied to your own business environment as well. So the work that I um, would do with a financial services organization I'd want it to look and feel like it belongs to that business. So there is some elements of best practice generally that can be applied, but are we bringing in the right brand and the right design standards for that organization? How does the regulatory environment and the type of best practice we need to apply there differ from, say, if I was working with Ella and thinking about the work that the NHS do as well? So it's always got to be tailored for the individual organization. But again, the really powerful thing about Blueprint is it gives you the tools to start thinking about and driving that conversation as well. So that's proficiency. Let's look at the next one and then we'll get into some of the detail um, where I can show you the website and some of the other assets as well. So community, I'll keep it relatively light, but um, for me, the piece around communication, actually engaging people and getting them engaged and building a community are really, really powerful. 
And often when we think and talk about new technologies or we get really excited about building a Tableau dashboard, we can put this as a secondary item. And I suppose again here we're just saying, let's make sure we've considered it. Let's make sure we've started to take some steps because that's so powerful as well to get people excited about using Tableau, to make sure that they continue using Tableau. Um, we find often that as a development community, people love giving back as well. People quite like coming. And when I've been to these sessions in the past, um, seeing people give back and talking about the work they've done and, and how they've really helped to coach people and get them engaged. And for me, sessions like this and content like this on the screen is really powerful for that. One thing that really sticks out in my mind um, is, is some of the conversations that we've had and the dashboards that people have shown in terms of really making use of those new features. So I know we've got a session um, coming up later today to talk about some of those new features as well, which I think really kind of embodies this. So communications, and I'll talk you through the, um, the website for this in a second. How are we actually communicating to people what Tableau can do? Now, if I wanted to set up a SharePoint internally tomorrow, what sort of content might I throw up on that? Um, what sort of things would really resonate for my um, audience, for my organization, taken from a load of pre-canned materials that I can get up to speed with really quickly? And what lessons have been learned from, from people? Is it newsletters? Um, is it SharePoint sites? Uh, is it sessions like this internally and externally that we can point people towards? The same applies for engagement. Who are those people in the organization who are really going to evangelize this tool and get people engaged? The, um, the people who have a real passion for this, like Ella, like Lorna, like Colin, who live and breathe Tableau every day. You know, if you can get that sort of character in your organization to start talking to um, different people and sharing their knowledge, that can be so powerful. Um, and then in terms of support as well, I really love this idea of having those Tableau doctor sessions, and that can be provided by groups like Tableau, but internally having people with a bit of capacity to talk about some of their experiences or get people to come along to sessions like this um, as a really soft way of making sure you're communicating and engaging with your teams. So there's so much more um, to come on that, and I know Steve will touch on a lot of these points, but I did want to share as a way of showing you through some of the Tableau content online, what this looks like. So let's have a look. Hopefully I can see it's just flipped onto the website. So Blueprint provides this incredible way of navigating through all of these topics. This one here is just centered on communications. And for me, this is that example of, we're using Tableau, we're starting to get people excited. What do we need to tell them about? What do we need to walk them through to get them to use some different features and some different functionality, really helping people make the best of the technology. And you can see as well as the, um, the view on the left hand side that helps you navigate, you've got all of your main content. And for me, let's talk about Tableau enablement and intranet. But you can see there's a couple of others as well. You could point people towards Tableau forum um, and how you can get really engaged there. There are some good examples of blogs and newsletters that you can point people towards. But let's talk about this one, the enablement internet. And it just provides so much content that you can lift, adapt to your organization and get people excited about. You could obviously just point people towards this, but we've often found that having something inside a firewall built into an internet page, built into a SharePoint site that people feel is really part of their organization uh, in the right branded colors with some additional context about what that organization is trying to achieve and um, really helps to get people engaged. So there's a really great structure. It provides suggestions on different bits that it would recommend you uh, adding to your site. You can obviously pick and choose, um, but there are individual topics that you can go and drill in that have, um, that have overviews with screenshots. Right. That might sound really simple, but it saves you from thinking through um, the structure that you might need. So let's pick one like use custom views. So if I want people to start using custom views, I can come in here and I can start thinking through the content and how it's structured. 
then I can start thinking about maybe reusing some of that as well. So all really, really powerful stuff that's just preloaded for you to get you thinking about how you might use some of these topics. So that overall framework, that overall picture, which I'll come back to, um, that has the tube line type view, that's really powerful for getting you thinking broadly at the high level. But behind each of those dots, there's that real detail. Um, and we just find that we keep coming back to it and talking to clients, not about all the areas all of the time, but to provide that way of thinking about things. Um, we find that really powerful. I think I've got two more slides on Blueprint that I want to chat through. And do feel free to post any questions as we go along in the Q&A. So two things that I want to say. One, it's a repeatable process. You know, that's the whole point of this framework is you can apply it in a number of different situations. You can make use of the bits that work for you. And that could be, if you're at bullet point number one, discovering, discovering and starting to think about using Tableau and, and similar tools for your organization. Or you could be at that point again where you've already got people using it. Maybe you've got some performance issues and you want to investigate that. You're looking to evolve your use of Tableau and tools like that. So it doesn't matter where you are in this process. There's content for you. Um, and at the bottom, I say, let's look through a spreadsheet. So this is, again, a useful tool on the Tableau website that will help you depending on where you are in that journey. And I'll bring that up on the screen now. The thing to say about this spreadsheet, though, it does need a bit of a visual overhaul. It's not the best looking. But again, as part of that same take on the framework, it's got amazing content in there. So if you wanted to think about roles and responsibilities, if you wanted to think about architecture, if you actually just wanted to get a bit of a better handle on what are people doing in terms of data and analytics in your organization, then it's got a really great starting point. And it's not going to be the be all and end all for every organization. But you can use this to um, to really start thinking about different topics in a structured way, in a detailed way, in a high level way, if you want to, um, it can be really powerful. And um, there's a question in the, the Q&A, at what point can you start this? Would, you, would I recommend a starting point? Um, it really depends on where you are as an organization, because if you are um, just starting on that journey, on that Tableau journey, uh, you've either got a couple of dashboards up and running as an individual and you're trying to break ground as a team, then start right at the beginning and think about the overall picture and kind of cross off the ones that you don't need to focus on too much yet. Um, but maybe you could consider starting off a little bit in each area and at least having a bit of a plan that pulls together some of these points as well. And I think what we found is it really demonstrates to people who ultimately are going to be investing in this tool and technology that you've thought about all of the things that are going to be needed. Some of them can be 12 months out, but you're starting to give people that confidence that you know what's going to really help get this tool embedded and ultimately tie it towards whatever business outcome that you're trying to achieve. So I mentioned on one of those bullet points, it was about managing expectations and it's also about business requirements as well. So going through this process, I'm really starting to think about different use cases what are people trying to do? What kind of data sources support them? That's really important as well. Getting people to invest in this, getting people to set up communities, it has to be for a purpose. It has to be often the business reason that you're trying to do things. So there's loads of great material here that you can start to use to think about different people who are using Tableau, how you manage that, how you maintain that, community, roles and responsibilities. Um, and again, just to reiterate how much great content there is out there. Let me go back to my slide deck and then there's one more piece on um, Blueprint. So this final piece is um, really just to say it's still a living and breathing thing as well. You know, the website may not look as flash as some, but this is being updated really regularly. So this last update was in November 2020. Um, and there's updates from months before that and months before that, which is driven by the community. So people who think we need more information in this case about content management, you know, they've expanded the thread on that to give people more insight. And um, so you can regularly check back and keep going with the updates on that. 
So I'd really recommend Blueprint, particularly with this view, and to come back to that why it's important. If you've worked in an environment where you've gone through that process of having a few dashboards, getting people excited, and getting people to use it, and, and pretty much with any technology um, deployment, you can experience this dip after the initial launch, as maybe it doesn't meet the performance expectations, maybe your um, team isn't able to deliver at pace yet as they're getting uh, skilled up, and that can be a bit of a problem for people. So tools like Blueprint are meant to say, okay, well, if we think about and if we structure things in the right way, then we can accelerate, we can get that proficiency, we can make sure we minimize that performance dip. It's not going to continue accelerating exponentially, but it is going to actually sustain that performance. And that, for me, is one of the real powers of things like Blueprint. I think I've got maybe a, a minute left. Um, I want to talk just briefly on something else called Navigator. And really, the purpose here is to say Blueprint's an incredible framework. The, the key for me is that it's a framework to get you thinking, and other frameworks are available. We used to talk to clients a lot about this, which is called Navigator, and it thinks in the same way. You're talking to people about people, you're talking to people about platform, and what are the areas that make up that? And if you can break that down, and if you can start thinking about those areas, um, and where you are on your journey and applying it to your organization, then that's the most important thing to take away from this. And we actually did a bit of an exercise just to say, how do Blueprint and Navigator kind of map together? And you can see there's so much overlap, and that is um, a really great example of that point. You know, it's just about getting people to think broadly and to give people the resources to go and start investigating, okay, what's the monitoring work I need to do? How do my people come into play here? Uh, and that's a great lead into what Steve's going to talk in, talk to in a minute as well. So think about the framework. That would be my big recommendation. There's some incredible content online to go and explore. Um, but just by having a view of that framework and thinking it through, that's where a lot of that benefit comes, rather than necessarily worrying too much about getting into all of the detail on all of these topics up front. So are there any other um, questions from anyone? Uh, anything anyone else would like to know? Um, obviously, I'll stick around um, afterwards and we can get together. And if not, I'm, I'm happy to, to pass back to Lorna, Ella, Colin. And we'll that was there. great. That was great. Thanks, John. More questions in the chat, unless I've missed it. Um, but that's brilliant. But I guess, as you say, you're going to stick around at the end and then people can talk to you about a bit more. But now the blueprint's really good and uh, great to see you. Thanks, you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. That was great. Um, let's um, bring Steve to the stage. Let's come up and uh, it's time for you to present. Hi. Oh, I can't hear you. Work all okay. How's that? There we go. You're on. Right, let me just uh, stay on there, Ella, while I just make sure I share my screen, the correct screen. Yeah. How is that? Yep, perfect. All right. Great, thank, you. thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, um, good morning, everybody, from the deep south of Buckinghamshire, just west of London. Uh, I hope wherever you are dialing in from, you are keeping safe and well. Um, as Ella said, my name's Steve. And I'm delighted to be talking to you today about crossing the chasm to scale your Tableau Center of Excellence. And just a, a huge um, round of applause to John for his introduction earlier about Blueprint and Navigator. And I think the, the key takeaway that I, I, I took a couple of key takeaways from there that I'm going to echo in this presentation around there are frameworks out there for you to use, um, but they are um, frameworks and they're not the be all or be all or end all, and, they, and you should use these to tailor um, your progress forward for your organization. And there's no need to start from scratch using these frameworks and look to utilize them to, I love the impact, increase the impact of adoption. So my objective of the next 20, 20, 20 to 25 minutes, excuse me, is to share some key principles and practical examples to keep in mind when extending your analytics center of excellence. 
I'm happy to take your questions. Please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Now, there is some audience participation as well through this. So I'm going to try this. Hopefully it will work and uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how we get on. OK. <laughs> So just to confirm that in this presentation, I am representing myself and the views expressed are my own. And before I get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like you to come with me on a small journey back in time, back to 2014. So think back seven years, you know, if you feel like it's share in the chat window, you know, what are your memories of 2014? What, what was going on in your life? Perhaps you had just left university and got your first job, you know, bought your first house or flat, got married or even had your first kiss. Um, but in 2014, the Winter Olympics were held in Sochi. Germany won the Football World Cup again. Pharrell Williams and Happy was the best-selling song of the year. And perhaps most importantly, Gangnam Style reached 2 billion views on YouTube. So let me just check, see if anybody's uh, put anything in the chat. No, nobody's going to share. I'll get, I'll keep get, get, maybe we can come back to that later. Oh, here we go. Thanks, Dan. I left permanent employment to start a consultancy company. It was a very good year. Some love for Gangnam Style from John. Thank you very much. That's, that's awesome. Living my best life at uni, Sophie. Okay, well, we won't go into that. Well, maybe you can share later in the networking, just graduating uni. Fantastic. Thanks for the participation. For me, 2014 was important because it was the year that I started my Tableau journey. Here I am at Tableau Bootcamp with my friend Philippe, uh, being inducted in all things Tableau before returning to start my role as European Director of Professional Services based in London. And for the next four years, I help clients like Lloyds Bank, Unilever, Lufthansa and Roche Pharmaceuticals deploy Tableau across their organization and had a fantastic time doing it. I left Tableau in 2018 and since then uh, I've been working as an independent consultant, freelancing with organizations like Mars and Inmarsat to help them uh, create analytics COEs, accelerate deployment of Tableau across their business and look to gain the business advantage and business outcomes that they're looking, they were looking for. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, I'm currently open for work and looking for my next opportunity. So if you'd like to have a chat about how I could help you and your organization, please feel free to contact me via any of these methods. And shameless plug over. Um, in the last seven years, I've worked with lots of customers like this gentleman. He was an innovator who had ridden the early adopter wave and was a rising data rock, rock star. He and his small team were helping people see and understand data in Tableau in ways never seen before in their organization. They were surfing the data wave and enjoying it. Now, unfortunately, you can't keep surfing the data wave forever with only enthusiasm and hard work. History has shown that if you continue with just that approach, the likelihood is that you will plummet over the edge of the waterfall into the deep chasm below. So what should you do to enable your organization to keep moving forward from the initial successes that you have delivered? How can you ensure that you will cross the chasm to scale Tableau across your enterprise? What capabilities, skills, roles, and organizational structures should be considered when planning to extend out your Tableau Center of Excellence? And when should you start? In John's presentation, there was a comment about when should you start? So let's, let's tackle that one first. You know, here's a, a typical adoption curve. We've he already heard earlier in this presentation about the wonderful innovators and early adopters. Maybe you've been in these groups yourselves as one of the cool kids working with the shiny new thing. And after that comes typically comes the chasm that needs to be crossed to get the majority categories and the laggards on board. I really like this graphic about the lady in the late majority about what are these weirdos up to and the gentleman at the end about, you know, I want my fax machine back. <laughs> it just always makes me laugh. Um, so a good indication about when to start planning to cross the chasm is when you are getting increasing demands from the early adopters and the innovators and more inquiries from the early majority. 
you know, the, the innovators and early adopters are saying, can we have this, can we have that? The early majority are saying, I've heard of this Tableau thing, you know, what is it, you, what is it all about? Can you help me understand you know, what, it's gonna, what it could mean for me? So all of these are signs that the chasm is starting to, to open up. So start planning then and, and always seek to be one or two steps ahead and try and keep the tornadoes to a minimum. So in the innovation and early adopter stages, you've probably established um, your platform and started to prove some value. Crossing the chasm means putting the foundations in place for scaling at pace. And a key requirement when crossing the chasm is to make sure you understand the why. Why are you doing this? Why are you embarking on your analytics journey? And your analytics strategy must tie into your overall business strategy. And it's vital that every decision from this point aligns with the why. And one of the critical elements that you're going to need to put in place as you move from the why to the how are the capabilities, skills, roles, and organizational structures to deliver the business outcomes and benefits expected by the organization. In 2018, I'm just going to pause a sec. Okay, everyone okay? Still just checking. All right. In a 2018 study, McKinsey found that 60%, 60% of the top performing companies utilizing analytics had a center of gravity for their analytics efforts. They found that these top performing companies, the difference was versus the others was that their center of gravity, of excellence, of enablement, whatever you want to call it, had the specific capabilities, skills and roles in place, which would then spiral out into the wider business to accelerate the benefits gained from analytics. Please note that center doesn't necessarily mean that you need to cluster everybody in, in the group in one location, in one place. We'll talk about more about this later. And for the purposes of this presentation, capability is the ability to do something complemented by the skill, which is the ability to do that something, activity or job well. So you need both the capability and the skill. Just a little pause for some more to hear. So what McKinsey was saying was that capabilities and skills matter. And in their view, that the, these three core capability groups were important. And notice how they overlap because some of the capabilities sit at the intersection of these groups. I personally don't feel that the McKinsey study goes far enough. Then these, the capabilities and skills need to be broken down further. So in addition to the business and analytics, they need to be supported by the capabilities around people, data, technology, and process. And we saw this in John's presentation in the, in the slalom framework. And all of these require leadership to support and sponsor the overall strategy. So in my experience, if you don't have all these other capability groups in place or all of these capability groups in place, you're gonna to struggle to scale out your analytics strategy at pace. A common error that I've seen in organizations is that they concentrate their efforts on data technology and process. How many of you, of you have heard comments like, well, we can't start our analytics program until we sorted out our data, or we must have all our processes in place before we start with analytics. Now, I'm not saying that these areas, areas are not important, they are. However, if you focus just on these alone or approach them with the wrong context, you are likely to create an analytics platform that works brilliant, brilliantly for IT, but fails the most important group, your people. And why are people the most important group? Because quite simply, people are the biggest barrier to your success. And studies have proven, and you've probably experienced yourself, and here's another opportunity for audience participation, is that, you know, what problems have you seen when you've been looking to scale out Tableau across your business? You know, the behavioral change is the biggest obstacle to succeeding in any transformation, analytics, data, or otherwise. So the best practice, strong recommendation is you look at everything through a people lens. Consider how you can make life easy and simple for your analytics community, whatever role they play. Communicate to these people, coach them through the change, not just once, but constantly, and help them achieve joy with analytics because their success will be your success. 
Now, this slide is a busy slide, and I'm just going to pull out a, a couple in each group of, of, of key capabilities for you to think about. In people, I really recommend having a clear and effective adoption and exploitation capability that's supported by change management. That whole communication is really, really key. In business, it's really important to have business capabilities. It's really important to have this analytics translation capability. So that's somebody that's able to speak, be business facing and talk business, and also have the ability to talk about analytics to the analytics team, this foot in both camps, okay? Similarly, in analytics, the ability to capture and translate business problems well is, is, is vital. It's another key skill, so critical thinking. I'm speeding up a bit because I'm just conscious of time. Um, maybe somebody can give me a, a time check if I'm running out of time. Um, so when speaking to business users, it's really critical to be able to speak their language, not your language. So think about concepts like critical thinking, design thinking, and getting them into your center of excellence or gravity. Now, of course, you need all the supporting capabilities of data technology and process and absolutely you, you needing trusted, accurate data to build on. Uh, they all support the, the row above technology necessary, process also necessary. And um, again, the comment was made earlier by John is that you know, with process, don't drown your an analytics initiative with process. You know, make it fit for purpose, make it uh, correct for the point in time, but do not uh, drown yourself in bureaucracy. And of course, you need strong leadership to drive the strategy and provide the sponsorship and advocacy. And again, as John mentioned, is the good news is you don't have to do all of these at once. You don't have to do all of these at the start. Choose, choose your own adventure. Pick those that you, you need at any particular point in time. Put, put these capabilities in place. And then next iteration round, look to extend. Next iteration round, look to extend. And take a progressive approach for building out your analytics capability over time. So that's a lot on capabilities. You know, that's all about what do you need? What capabilities and skills do you need in, in your COE? Next, you're going to need to look at the analytics operating model. How are you going to be organized so that all the elements of your organization can work together with analytics? And whatever operating model you choose, make sure that it's clearly communicated and understood by all levels of the business. And remember that the people that you're speaking to will want to know what's in it for them, where you are now and where you're going to be by when, because it's all about what's in it for me and how it's going to make their lives easier. At Inmarsat, I use this color coding when I was speaking to key stakeholders across the business to outline where we were at that point in time and where we were looking to be over the next 18, to, uh, 18 months to two years. And as I've said before, and John said before me, is that it's important to note that not one size fits all. And that center doesn't mean that everybody is in one team in one location. The operating model will just be clear about who's accountable for what and how the different teams are going to work together. And that's absolutely fine. Now, in my experience, federated or also called hybrid or blended works best because what it does, it gives you the ability to have this guiding central team, this guiding center of gravity that provides the muscle across people, data, technology, and process out to the business to exploit and consume data. Okay, I'd be interested in the chat to share what, what kind of operating model do you have at the moment in your business and how well does it work? So once you've got your capabilities and skills and you've got your target operating model defined, you can define the roles and responsibilities that you need at each step of your journey. So I love the, you know, this, this is a, uh, an extension of the McKinsey slide from earlier. And it talks about these people in between the two groups of the analytics translators, the foot, these are the guys with the foot in both camps, the data engineers that are really churning out the trusted and accurate data sources, the visualization specialists. So these are all, again, you don't need all of these at the start, but look to include these capabilities and these roles and remembering that people can sometimes wear many hats um, within your organization. So pulling all that together and a few more, only a few more slides is that here's an example based on what happened at Mars that I've seen replicated at other organizations like Lloyds Bank, Schroders, Credit Suisse and JLR. 
Again, just an example only. The steps that you take will depend on your organization and your business strategy. But note the steps. You know, so dream big, but plan on taking cumulative steps to deliver value and, and adjust your path as you go along. Because I guarantee you will learn lessons as you go along and there will be unforeseen challenges to overcome. And, and a reminder to always plan a step or two ahead. So at Mars, the first foundational steps involved in, uh, installing Tableau Server and delivering some initial small projects with a team of five resources. These provided some quick wins. We also set up an internet landing page and a collaboration platform. I think it was Slack there, but we've seen Teams come on stream a lot more. And note that if you don't plan ahead, it's likely that you'll have stagnation and missed opportunities. The second step is the, the start to cross the chasm and scaling out the capacity and the capabilities. You'll be transitioning to your first operating model and you'll be clear about, as clear as you can be, about the analytics roles and responsibilities. And the communication element there is vital. I found it valuable in many of the organizations that I've worked with to have a structured onboarding plan at this stage. Now, it doesn't have to be um, too difficult. Even something as simple as an email sent to new license holders to say to them, congratulations on your new license. Here's the link to the internet landing page. Here's the link to some Tableau training. This is who we are. We're here if you can help you, if you need some help. You know, so something as simple as that combined with uh, a welcome webinar and, and the ability to book a data doctor to get some help, that's plenty good enough at the start. You know, and at Mars, we used exactly those concepts to rapidly increase the number of creative users and collaborative teams across the business. In fact, in the first six months, we onboarded 400 users, 400 new users across the globe onto the Tableau platform. So simple really does work. And finally, in that, in that final step, you're well across the chasm and have the early majority very much on board. You might even have some of the late majority, what are these weirdos doing and the laggards getting on the bus with their fax machines, you know, under their arm. <laughs> you might be running a, a regular events program or even have been funded to, to travel the world talking about the new way with analytics. And I know that happened at Mars, unfortunately, after I left and also at Dyson that they were able to go around the world. It's really important as you go through this journey, as well as the stepped approach to, approach to capture your successes as you go along, because that will then give you the leverage to do more and to get more funding. You know, at Mars, I used a simple one slide PowerPoint template that I mailed to all of our users of our platform. And within two weeks, I had 14 real specific use cases in my inbox that, that I then shared with the analytics VP who then shared with the CIO to get more funding for further scale up. So don't be shy to capture the successes that you are enabling across your business. Now in rough timescales, it's about six to nine months for foundation we found at Mars, 18 to 24 months for capacity and capability building. And you know what, with deliberate scale up, it's always ongoing, you, you will never reach the end. And what you might find is you have different people in their, your organization or different teams that they're at different, um, they're at different uh, parts of the organizations, they'll be in different models. So thanks very much for the, uh, for the input. Getting funded to travel the world is a compelling selling point to get it right, too true, too true. All right, so. In, in closing, I have one call to action and four key takeaways for you. And again, some audience participation would be great. So the call to action is to have a look at this capability grid and, and pick a capability that you are going to grow into in 2021. Perhaps you would like to develop your critical thinking skills to, to complement your visualization expertise or add analytics translation into your, into your skill set. You know what? And, and if, if you want to work hard on extending your data governance skills, that's absolutely fine. Nobody's going to judge. My personal commitment is for 2021 is that I really want to develop my skills and capabilities around data literacy. And perhaps that will be the subject of a different talk further down the line. So pick one or two of these capabilities, pop them in the chat window if you feel you're happy to share and commit to add them to your own personal development plan. I'd love to hear how you get on. So there's your call to action. 
The first key takeaway, again, echoing John, is remember that you and your organization are special. Um, yes, by all means, look at what others have done and learn from them and reach out to them. Use the frameworks like Blueprint and Navigator to help you understand what steps are possible, but always look to put it in your way that makes sense for your organization. Now, the steps, you, the steps organizations take typically are the same steps, but just not necessarily in the same order. So, for example, at Inmarsat, I took Blueprint and I adjusted it to be specific for what we needed to do at Inmarsat. If I just go back, you can see I took agility and I called it governance. And I, and I, I talked about this balance between empowerment and control the deliberate and, on, and consistent pathways for proficiency to drive the highest levels of analytics proficiency. And of course, the community aspect, very important. And please also note here about, you know, putting the foundations in place first and having this evolve mindset around evolving over time. So going back to that stepped approach. Second key takeaway is to start now and take these additive steps plan on, on setting a challenging scope in a, in a sensible amount of time and start executing. Do not do like some organizations that I've worked with where they think about things for a year, they plan for a year, and then maybe in the third year they might get around to do something. You know, six, uh, six to nine to maybe 12 month chunks and always iterating within are, is a good uh, mindset to have. So plan, do, measure, iterate and accept that you will learn lessons along the way. Build your program with a relentless commitment to improve at every stage. And if you're doing it right, you'll never finish. But working in this way is a proven method to ensure that you will start delivering value sooner rather than later and that you will deliver incremental business value over time. I love this graphic from Synergure, who are a boutique data consultancy organization that I got their permission to use because it really shows the, 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 the key concepts of incremental business value and the, you know, the, 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 the method of establishing and proving value, you know, the foundation that I talked about earlier, you know, scaling and preparing for scale, but giving you the, ex the ability to accelerate and then optimize across your business. So it's, it's what we've, what John and I have both been saying, but a slightly different way of, of looking at it. But the incremental business value in this level up framework, I really like. Now, this morning, I, I, I diced with death a little bit and put an extra slide in. So hopefully my segue is quite good. There will be dark days here. You know, there will be times on the journey you'll have your head in your hands and you'll be thinking to yourself, what am I doing? But And what is going on here? But if that does happen, just remember Captain Sir, Sir Tom Moore, where, you know, what a guy, what a guy, and may he rest in peace, you know, and just remember him and that tomorrow will be a good day. So if you do have a tough day, just remember Captain Sir Tom Moore. Third key takeaway is when staffing your COE, don't go seeking unicorns, you know, these jack of all trades that can do everything all by themselves. Just accept that establishing an analytics capability means you have a, need to have a team with a variety of capabilities and skills. It's better to think that your analytics center of gravity is like a Formula One pit stop, pit stop crew, couldn't say that very well, where each individual is enabled and highly effective in their particular role and is contributing to a common goal. Look at them all ready to go there. You've got the guy with the jack, the guy with the wheel, the guy that's taking the wheel off, putting the wheel on. You know, they're all highly trained and highly effective in what they're doing to achieve a common strategy which in your case will be your company's analytics strategy in support of the overall business strategy. And the final key takeaway is the most important one. Remember that analytics is a people business. Partner with your people across the organization. Collaborate with them because collaboration is where the magic happens. Look at everything with your people lens and work towards giving your analytics community joy in their work. So in closing, I hope I've achieved my objectives of providing you with some key principles and practical examples on the capabilities, skills and roles required when say, scaling out your analytics COE. When you embark on this journey, I encourage you to have fun 
work hard and celebrate success. Dance in the street if that's your thing and it makes you happy. And whatever you do, enjoy the ride. Thanks very much. Oh, that was brilliant, Steve. Thank you very much. That was really good. Um, right, I'll quickly hand over. We're slightly behind time, but um, that's not a problem. Um, so I'll hand over to Abdi. He's going to talk about the new features of Tableau. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Okay, let me just share my screen. Could you guys let me know if you can see it? Uh, share. Cool. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, let me just go back to chat. Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, today I'll just be talking about all the new features in sort of 2020.4 and 20.3. Uh, so my name's Abdi, I'm a solution engineer here at Tableau. And what that means is that I help customers get up to speed uh, with Tableau and get the most out of the platform. Um, so before they make their purchase. And I've been with Tableau so about seven months now. So I'm relatively new to the Tableau world. Uh, and I'm a Brummie, so I've grown up in Birmingham most of my life, uh, apart from when I decided to be adventurous and go to Coventry for university. So the agenda for today is that first I'm going to do some honourable mentions. So these are so the focus on the session today will be on multiple map layers and also the predictive functions. But there's a couple of features that I'd like to quickly sort of just touch upon uh, because they are quite good, and I feel that few people might not be aware of them, so it's good to sort of raise awareness of them. So we'll do the honourable mentions, then we'll focus on reviewing the predictive functions in 20.3 and also what's new in 20.4. And then finally, I'll quickly touch upon sort of the multiple map layers, and we can do a bit of a quick uh, Q&A if there's a bit of time. So on to the honourable mentions. Uh, so the first thing that I really want to point out is the analytics extensions in Tableau Online. Um, so this is being able to use tab, uh, Python and R and et cetera all within Tableau uh, Online. Uh, now for a lot of people, um, this, was only, this was only possible in Tableau Server before. And for a lot of people, for a lot of my customers, um, Tableau Online was perfect for them. But because they needed Python and R support, they were, had to go with Tableau Server and also of the extra costs uh, associated with that. So this has been sort of a big ask for quite a while, and I'm quite happy that that's been delivered now. The other new feature in 20.4 is Tableau Prep in browser. So Tableau Prep, which used to be a standalone desktop product, is now available all within the browser. And so sort of the advantages for this are sort of twofold for the analyst. Uh, before Tableau Prep, obviously, is quite a hungry program, and it depends. The performance depends on how spec your machine is. If you have an under spec machine, it can uh, it might take a bit of a while to perform for certain tasks if you're using sort of absolutely massive data sets. Uh, with this, you can now leverage the power of the server that your tablo Tableau is running on, or Tableau Online uh, in this particular case. So you can, with much larger data sources, you can get much speedier performance if your server is hopefully uh, got more performing power than your laptop. And for IT as well, what this means is that they could just upgrade server and everyone is on the latest and greatest version. So there's no more mismatch between versions, et cetera. Uh, a couple of web authoring improvements, you can now sort of create extracts uh, without leaving the browser, uh, which really helps with the web authoring flow. We have fixed sets, um, so you can do some of the analysis that just wasn't possible before in web editing, uh, and some of the more advanced analysis that sets uh, allow, and some as data improvements as well for sort of the explorers, et cetera, uh, in your business uh, to give them an improved flow. And then there's a bunch more. There's just not even all of it. I'd highly recommend you go to Tableau 20.4 new features and have a look at them. But a few that I'd like to point out, which might be an interest to a few people, is Tableau Server Management is now available on Linux. So it's been a bit asked for a while. Uh, and with a bunch of new data connectors and custom fiscal dates. So if you've ever worked with a client that has some really weird fiscal dates, like it starts every fourth new moon or something really weird like that. Uh, it has been a bit of a pain to work with before. So hopefully this new feature now should make it quite a cinch uh, in order to work with data like that. So that's sort of the end of the honorable mentions. So now let's focus on the predictive modeling functions. Um, so the aim of this was to give domain experts sort of a bigger statistical target to solve problems while keeping them within the analytical sort of Tableau workflow and reducing the friction of switching tools to something like Python. Uh, so there's a spectrum of users as the target audience. We have business analysts, data scientists, and sort of everything in between. And 
they have different backgrounds, sort of histories and different understandings of business and the problems they're trying to solve. But what they typically have in common is that deep knowledge of their data, how it's created, manipulated, what could be achieved with it, coupled with a good base knowledge of Tableau. And the predictive modeling functions are just two table calculations which were released in 20.3 and we've recently updated them in 20.4. And they use the same engine behind explained data. They allow customers to make predictions without needing uh, time series data like been before to sort of populate sparse data so missing data in your data sets to find outliers and also you can export these predictions and you can use them downstream in calculations and these are all things that would have been possible before using python or r in the analytics extension but that requires programming knowledge uh, which can exclude some sort of domain experts uh, as well as requiring switching of tools which can slow down analysis and also because it's an external service, there's always a bit of a lag. Uh, so if you, for example, add in a category, you try to split your data by the category, there's always a bit of a lag because it has to go to an external service. Because this is inbuilt to Tableau, it's just as fast as using the table calculation which you're uh, currently using. So the two table calculations are model percentile and model quantile. So I'm going to quickly review them at a high level. Don't worry if you don't understand straight away. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into a live demo where I'll cover the basics and also show the new improvements in 20.4. So the model percentile function is the one that we're currently looking at here. What it does is that it builds a model using input variables and then predicts the percentile of the mark. So what I mean by that is in this example, based on the inputs, which are region, infant mortality rate, birth rate, and the health expenditure per capita. What I want to know is for a particular mark, so a country, for example, is the life expectancy above what we expected? Is it above average? Is it in the 90th percentile, for example? Or is it way below what we expect? Is it in the 20th percentile, etc.? Model quantile, on the other hand, is the inverse of that. Again, it allows you to choose your predictors. And this time, you can choose a specific uh, percentile, i.e. 0.5 for the median, uh, but what it does is that it returns a predicted value. So this, what this will do is based on the birth rate for each country or for each mark, etc., it will return the median life expectancy for a female. So just to recap, the model percentile, you pass in a value and it returns the percentile the value is at, if it's above average or below average, while model quantile, you pass in a percentile and it returns the predicted value. Uh, again, don't worry if that doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm going to show a few examples now that should hopefully make it concrete. But at the end of the day, these are basically just table calculations. So if you understand table calcs, then you'll understand how to use these. So I'm just going to jump into Tableau. So this is, uh, I'm using the World Indicators dataset that just comes inbuilt to Tableau. And this view that I have here is the female life expectancy uh, on the y-axis uh, against the median health uh, expenditure uh, per capita on healthcare. And it's just been log logarithmically, if I pronounced that correctly, uh, transformed. Uh, and we can start to see some patterns. We see a few outliers over here uh, and at the top, et cetera. Uh, but what I want to do is uh, sort of given uh, health expenditure per capita, what I want to do is understand which ones are above or below sort of immediately and try to find any outliers that I can find in my data set. Um, because I want to look at if a mark is above average or below average, what the function we want to use is the model percentile function. So I'll show you what it looks like. <clears throat> Let me just zoom in just for visibility. Okay. So the first input to this function is always the value that you want to know if it's above or below average. So I want to know if life expectancy for a female is above average or below average. And then any subsequent inputs that you give into the function are the inputs to your function that are used to train the model. So what I want to know is based on health expenditure per capita is the life expectancy for a particular mark above or below average. And what this function will return is a value between 0 and 1. So 0 0.1 will be the 10th percentile, while 0. Point, uh, sorry, 0 0.9 will be the 90th percentile. And you can use these downstream in calculations. And that's what I've done here. So I've just created a little calculation to, so there's a lot here, but all I've done is just created buckets. So I've said, 
is the value that we've got back, is it no, then set it to no. Otherwise, is it in the extremes? Is it in the 90th percentile or is it in the 10th percentile? In which case, put it in this particular bucket. Otherwise, is it between 0 0.8 and 0 0.7? Put it in this bucket, so on and so forth, until we get right to the bottom where it's right in the middle, it's at the 50th percentile, it's at the median. Uh, and that'll be a bucket sort of for itself. So I'm just gonna hit apply. And then what I can do is drag this new downstream calculation that references the model percentile function onto color. And now we can start to see where our outliers are. Uh, so we can see the values that are directly at the 50th percentile, sort of median of what we'd expect. Then we can look at those outliers. We can see the countries which are which have a life expectancy for a female way above what we would expect it to be based on the health expenditure per capita. That's probably because there are way more factors into play uh, that we haven't considered in this model, but this is just a very basic model. So for example, like Vietnam, Albania, Armenia, and conversely, which have countries which based on how much they're spending per capita have quite low uh, female uh, life expectancy. And then what we'll notice as well is we have a bunch of no's. So these are countries like Hong Kong and Guam, uh, Aruba, Zimbabwe, etc., where we don't have data for the health expenditure per capita. So we can't make predictions based on this. So this is sparse data. This is, we have nulls in our data set. So this is where the second function comes into play. So this is the one that predicts uh, a value or the model quantile function. And how that can be used is very similar. I'm going to click edit and then zoom in. So ignore this power to the 10, literally all it's doing is just transforming back from a logarithm. And what you need to focus on is this aspect over here. So we have 0 0.5, I'll come to that in a bit. The first input we have is what we wanna predict. So because our median health expenditure, we have nodes in our data set, what we want to do is predict that. Uh, so that's what the first input means. And then as with the model percentile function, any inputs after that, are the inputs to your model, what you want to build the model based on, what your features are gonna be, in which in this case, we have the average life expectancy uh, and the region. So given these two variables, I want to know what is my median healthcare expenditure per capita. Uh, and then 0 0.5, what this does is it tells the percentile that you want this to be at. So do you want the, I want the median healthcare expenditure at the 50th percentile, uh, and I can obviously vary this so I can have a look at what it would be if it was in the extremes, uh, if it was in the 90th percentile, the 10th percentile, et cetera. Um, so we can just drag this and add it to our tooltip. And then you can see now that right at the bottom for these countries like Hong Kong, we have, based on the inputs that we've given the model, it's predicted uh, 605 for the median healthcare expenditure per capita and so on for the other uh, marks. And you can actually go one step further. So you can use this uh, to fill in the gaps in your data set. Um, so you can completely get rid of these and include them in the general trend by using the predicted values where it doesn't exist. So that can be used to sort of fill in the sparse data. And then another thing I like to point out as well is you're not just limited to using those calculations on the view that it was built. You can use them like any other field within Tableau. So the variable that I created earlier, so that was using the model percentile function and telling me if it was above or below average, and then using it to using this variable, to, using this calculation to sort of categorize it, uh, we can use that in this particular view over here. So this is the female life expectancy uh, on the y-axis against the average birth rate. And then we start to see a pattern as the average birth rate increases, we can see a decrease in the life expectancy of the female, uh, which makes sense. Uh, so I can use that calculation that I created earlier, which takes data in from the life expect uh, life expectancy, uh, sorry, from the healthcare expenditure, drag this onto color, and I can use this to add another layer of information on on my data. Uh, so because these are essentially just feels like any other, they can be created or set up by experts, uh, and then they can be added to the data model. So that's uh, end users. Uh, can use these predictions like they were uh, any other field and they don't have to recreate these from scratch essentially uh, so you can just publish it to dates uh, to a table of mind for example and then they can use that or you can use something like prep to actually put it into the data itself so that was 
a quick recap of the predicted functions uh, that were released in 20.3. So what I want to do now is show the new features in 20.4, as well as give another example for how the model quantile function is used. So what we have here is I'm now using the Superstore data set. And in gray, I have my actual sales, uh, which trans month on month, et cetera. And then in red, I have a predicted sales. So using my model quantile function, this is what I've predicted the sales to be. So let's have a look at that uh, prediction, at that calculation. So what we have here, oops, is so we've we've had we have the prediction at the 50th uh, percentile, so the median. What we're trying to predict is the sum of sales. So remember, the first input is always what you're trying to predict with the model quantile function. And then we have our two inputs. So we've got this uh, discrete date and a continuous date. So for those who are not familiar, a discrete date uh, is essentially uh, you typically used for um, seasonality. Um, so let's say you have data from January 2019, January 2020, January 2021. Uh, if you group it in a discrete manner, it won't care about the different dates. It will just lump them all into one group. So this can be really useful if you don't care in your analysis what the year is going to be. Uh, you just care typically what happens in a January compared to a February compared to a March, etc. Now, this, the other one at the bottom is opposite. So this is a continuous date. So this means that a date in January of 2019 will be grouped differently to January 2020 and as well with January 21. And this can be useful if you wanna capture sort of long-term information, et cetera. So what I wanna show is when I remove one or two of these variables, what will happen to our prediction? So the first aspect, remember this captures seasonality of information. This captures what typically happens in a January or et cetera. So when I remove this from our model and hit apply, the model recalculates and what we have now is we have the general upward trend of our sales. So our sales are genuinely increasing as time's gone on. But because we've not included that seasonality aspect into our model, it's just not captured in the prediction. Uh, and that's something that's currently missing. Conversely, if we go back, if I remove the, uh, the continuous state and hit back and hit apply, what we can see now is our predicted model uh, has captured the seasonality aspect really well, but it hasn't captured the general overall trend. And it's only when you include both that you can get, okay, this is not the greatest model. It typically probably needs more uh, data, more inputs, but a pretty decent sort of approximation of our uh, sales. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's really important to realize so sort of what features or what inputs are going into your model, make sure that you take care uh, and you understand what type of uh, what type of inputs will probably give you a better prediction and will capture the information that you're trying to, to build, essentially. So that was um, the so what we've done now is we've predicted data that we already have. We can see we're comparing our prediction to our what we actually have in that month. But what people really want to do is I want to understand what my sales are going to be six months into the future or one year into the future, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this would have been possible before, uh, but it involved like a pretty hacky uh, calculation in order to extend the date range beyond what is present in your data, because Tableau would only map the data uh, up to uh, where it exists in your data. But obviously, since you don't have that data, you're trying to predict it, that wouldn't be possible. So a new feature we've added in 20.4 is this extend date range function. So you can extend the date range by one month, or for example, let's say custom. So I want to have a look at nine months into the future. And what this does is that it automatically updates the date range so that your prediction goes uh, as far as you want it to be. And just one important to note is that this is not just limited to the new table calculations. Uh, for those of you who use Python and R with Tableau, uh, this is completely independent and you can use it. And hopefully this should be quite welcome news uh, to you guys. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about is the models. So I've spoken a lot about uh, 
what I've told you so far is that these table calculations use the same engine behind explained data, but what does that really mean uh, in Scilab? So we have uh, basically the default model uh, in, uh, for these table calculations is good old linear regression, uh, the ONS method. Uh, but you also have two other models which are available to you. So you have, uh, if I can pronounce this correctly, regularized uh, linear regression uh, if you're worried about overfitting. And we also have Gaussian processes. And so you can choose which one uh, depending on what you feel uh, might best fit your data. And to use these different models, it's pretty easy. Uh, you use the exact same calculations that you've, you've been using before. The only thing you need to change now is just add a little uh, string at the top, which tells which model you want to use. So if you want to use the standard linear regression, this is not necessary. But if you want to use Gaussian processes or regular, regularized linear regression, uh, all you need to do is just add this little string at the top. So GP for Gaussian processes. And for regular, regularized linear regression, you just add RL. Uh, and the model will update. Apart from that, everything else is exactly the same. So you've got your predictor, what you're trying to predict, your inputs, and also what percentile you want the prediction, uh, you want the prediction to be at. And what I've got here is I've, for the data that we have, I've subtracted the actual data uh, from, the, uh, from the prediction. So I've got a residual, and literally all it does is it subtracts the data that we have, our actual data, from the predicted data to try and see how good of a fit this model is. In green, we have a really good fit. Uh, and then for sort of red means that it's quite a bad fit. And what we can see is for the data that we have here, Gaussian processes are tend to be a really good fit uh, overall. But then in, so for example, regularized regression and the ordinary ordinary linear squares, it tends to be quite uh, a bad fit for sort of these higher months, but it tends to be quite good sort of around the median of the trend. So with this, you can easily switch uh, between which model you want. So just to sort of recap with the predictive modeling functions, uh, if you want to understand if something is above or below average, if you want to understand what percentile it's, it's at, if you want to find outliers, the model percentile function is what you want to do. If you want to predict into the future, if you want to fill in sparse data or anything that requires predicting a value, the model quantile function is what you want to do. You can choose between three different types of models, uh, the Gaussian processes, uh, regularized linear regression and linear regression. And also you can extend the date range uh, quite easily and you don't have to rely on hacks to extend the date range beyond what is possible, uh, what is present in your data. So that was a quick overview of sort of predictive model functions and the new features. Uh, what I'd also like to cover as well is the map, uh, the map layers. Uh, so what I have, what you were limited to before, uh, essentially, is you, are, you can only have two layers on a map. And what this meant is for certain types of analysis. So for example, let's say you want to analyze London house prices, depending on how close you are to a Tesla charging point, to a supermarket, to uh, to a park, etc. All data like that, you are only limited to showing two pieces of information, two layers of information on a map, uh, which tend to be sufficient for a lot of people. But for those who needed that uh, more multifaceted sort of information, uh, it obviously just didn't fly. Um, so what we've added in twenty point four is the ability to add as many layers as you want onto the map. So just to show you what the data that I have here is just a bunch of spatial data uh, from London. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to drag out is my geometry for the London wards. So I'm just going to drop it. This should hopefully be very familiar to you guys. And then I'm just going to split it by the districts uh, just so that we can start to select different districts. And then one other piece of information that I might want to add to my uh, to my map is, let's say, I want to understand how close I am to a supermarket. So you might notice this little new UI feature up top. Uh, so you can just add a marks layer, just drop it, and this is now added. Uh, the supermarkets. Let's maybe color them in. Well, actually, let's maybe color the geometry in gray. 
Okay, so now we can sort the seed and supermarkets. So this was the maximum. Uh, this is what you could get up to in previous versions of Tableau. But now what you can do is add more information on top of that. So let's say I want to look at London uh, floodplains, for example. I can just drop them. And then that's not the floodplains, but that's something else. But okay, but you can start to add as many layers as you want uh, to try and get more sort of multiplicity sort of analysis. Uh, and then let's maybe drag canopy data so we can start to see uh, how far we are from uh, a park or et cetera, or something like that. And let's color this green. Now you can see that because this was added last, this is the topmost layer. Uh, but uh, what I really want is to, this to be at the bottom, essentially. I just want this to be there. Uh, I don't want people to be able to click on it. I just want it to, uh, uh, for the map, for how, for how the map looks. So I can quite easily uh, reorder how, how the layers, uh, the layers by just dragging, dropping, and just putting it right at the bottom. And then now you can see that it's right at the bottom. And then also because I don't want people to be able to select it, I just want it again, just so there for information, but not to be able to mess with my other layers. What I can do is I can disable selection. And then now when, I, when people click on it, uh, nothing will happen essentially. So you still be there, you still be able to see it, but you can disable click on it, which can be useful if you have multiple layers, uh, but you only want users to be able to drill down on certain uh, areas. Uh, now, this is a pretty ugly map. Um, so I'll show you what, uh, what it should look like. So this is, I found from the blog of Mark Reed, dataviz.blog. Uh, uh, and again, he's got all the layers that I showed you earlier. So the charging points, supermarkets, road noise, etc. So you can create maps that have sort of a lot of information on them uh, beyond sort of the two layers. And then this, because it's Tableau and we have a lot of people which are <laughs> very creative, um, this, uh, the community has found a bunch of ways to use this to their advantage. So I just want to show you some of the cool stuff that people have been doing. Uh, so we can create sort of sunburst charts, which would have been a lot harder to do in Tableau before. Or this is a really cool way is I've seen this, uh, I found this on LinkedIn. Unfortunately, I can't remember who it's by, but what they've done is they have used this feature to create zoomable maps. Oops, they've used this feature to create zoomable maps that people can start to draw down into. So that was a very quick overview of sort of the map layers sort of functionality and all the new features in Tableau. And hopefully this has been useful for a few people. Great, thanks Abdi, that was uh, brilliant. That was a good overview. Um, I think we had one question. Um, I don't know if you answered it. Which was by me, but no, <laughs> it's no. fine. Want to ask you a question and then we can yeah so on. it was more about the predictive calculation why mm -hmm. do you use the attr function on dates rather than because i always avoid attr um, and use min or max does that mm -hmm. make a difference um yeah i like to use attr because functionally if you have the right level of detail it won't make a difference at all the problem is that if someone uh uses a different a different type of view let's say they've got a, a bunch of different uh, aspects essentially uh, and you're only expecting a single value uh you can if you use min or max you can get the wrong values at times so i just like to use attr if i'm expecting to see only one value and if i return more than one value uh, something's gone wrong. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Colin had a question too. Yeah. So I think uh, so. Fantastic presentation. Really, really, uh, really insightful and useful. So thank you for that. Uh, the, so the map layer function. I've seen some people using that in a hacky kind of way in the rest of Tableau. Uh, I think essentially using like a make point to to leverage in the mapping functionality. Is there any or and it made to kind of extend this multiple um, marks with with different layers to the rest of the Tableau desktop. Uh, what do you mean? Sorry, I'm not, not quite following. Um, because Colin's breaking up a little bit, I'll sort of take his question on. I'm not explaining it very well. <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, where we have dual axes on measures, I think. Mm. Are you going to 
um, potentially enhanced Tableau product by being able to have multiple uh, layers, but based on measures rather than by maps? Oh, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, yes. I don't know anything about that being in development at the moment, uh, but I can have a look and if I'm able to share with you guys, uh, I'll do so. That'd be very cool. Maybe next time we could get a dev as well so that we could see yeah. some beta things coming out in the future. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're all in Seattle, so it's going <laughs> to be, <laughs> yeah. That doesn't matter. We'll just <laughs> do it in the middle of the night. Nice. But brilliant. Yeah, thanks, uh, Abdi. It was great to see those um, new features update. So, Ella? Great, thank you. Um, so we're just about finished. So just a couple of slides from us um, before we go. Um, just to kind of, we do this every time we have a tug, but I don't know if there's lots of new people here. So just to remind you, there's lots of stuff goes on between um, the Tableau user groups. There's a massive Tableau community. If you're not on Twitter, then get on Twitter if you want to find out more than, uh, about Tableau and get loads of tips from a massive uh, Tableau community, then it's, a, it's our big recommendation. Um, similar stuff on LinkedIn, but Twitter is a really good place to um, follow the hashtag data fam. Um, but there's loads of initiatives that you can join in. If you're kind of working on your data visualization skills, there's a few different initiatives, one around Makeover Monday that gives you um, a data set each week that you can make over and get feedback on. So it's a really good uh, process for really upping your skills. Um, there's Workout Wednesday that Lorna helps to run with so a few other people that's more around your kind of technical ability on uh, Tableau, so really setting out that you know what you're doing and again setting your weekly challenges, so that's really great. And there's ones, uh, for example, um, sports themed, there's healthcare themed, there's loads of different ones, so there's loads of stuff you can get involved in to really kind of up your game. And um, there is mentoring opportunities as well. Um, so if you're looking for a mentor or I think there's a bit of a shortage of mentors rather than mentees. So if you are up for kind of mentoring other people in the Tableau community, maybe new to the Tableau community, and um, that's a really good opportunity. I get a lot out of mentoring someone, so I can definitely recommend that process. And if you're looking for feedback, there is a hashtag um, that people now use. Oh, my doorbell's going. Um, <laughs> I don't have to answer it. Um, so if you're looking for that, I think on Twitter, you can go on hashtag data farm at feedback and get feedback on anything that you're looking to get feedback on. So that's just a couple of um, plugs around the Tableau community and lots of other stuff that happens. And then, oh, click on the right page. And then that's just a thank you from us. So thank you for the Information Lab and Lorna for letting us use Remo for their tug. It's a really good um, thing. Um, we haven't got a date for the next tug, but it'll probably be in about three months' time. Again, it'll be virtual, um, as you can imagine. Um, we're always looking for speakers. Uh, not necessarily venues at the moment, <laughs> um, but speakers. So if you're interested in, in speaking about anything and uh, get in touch with um, any of us, uh, the session is recorded today and we'll be, able to, uh, we'll be sharing that shortly. And anyone that attended will get an email with that link so you can see that. Um, so if you want to stick around, we're going to be back in the, um, I don't know what call it, tables. So you can chat to people and network and ask more questions if you want to. Um, but thanks for coming today and thanks to everybody. Thanks, everyone. We'll head Thank back to the tables now.